for edition number 70. Today we're talking about the new law that unclouds privacy. And we'll get more into this, but this covers the Cloud Act that was passed in the government stimulus uh, last Friday that's going to push the, well, it's going to keep the government operational through September, but that's basically what the theme of the title comes from. And again, just going through the table of contents, we have the same structure as usual, but looking at the word on the street, we have privacy in the public with the Cloud Act. The hype is sometimes real. We're going to look at a partnership announcement made by Verge and why I personally think that's kind of questionable and what other people in the community think about that. For Where's Blockchain, we're looking at Pepperback tokens, specifically the aggro coin and how it relates to having your own chilies. For what else you'd reach what for what else you should read today, we'll look into that a little more, but again, just short stories. For Bulls and Bears, it's going to be blockchain-based virtual gaming levels up. That has to do with Engine Coin and their recent partnership. And finally, Reddit unsubscribes from Bitcoin payments for the bear side. And then education, we're going to look at divergences. So, getting into it. The tweet of the day comes from Jameson Lop. And Jameson, a couple days ago, this was over the weekend or so, but I thought this was so relevant, said, Bitcoin is a game where everybody watches everybody else to make sure nobody cheats. And basically, when you come down to it, that's really what it is. Bitcoin is a way to make sure that people in the community are... Well, miners particularly are making sure that everybody is following the economic incentives that were put in place to make sure that Bitcoin can be considered a trustworthy system or a trustless system where you don't have to rely on the people that are um, necessarily involved in the game being correct, but you are able to trust that the information that they're putting forth into the blockchain is accurate or trustworthy based off of the economic incentives that are in line with proof of work and Bitcoin mining. It gets very, it gets much more complicated than that. But basically, when it comes down to it, explain it to me like I'm five, explain it to me like I'm three. Uh, Jameson does a pretty good job of doing that here. <clears throat> Going to word on the street. So, again, on Friday, the government, or Congress passed a stimulus bill that allowed the government to operate through September to make sure they don't go belly up until then. They needed more funding. In total, it was $1.3 trillion. But within that, it was thousands and thousands of pages. I believe it was somewhere around two to three grand in total pages. But within there are a bunch of different laws, a bunch of different details that nobody really has the time to look through. And you really find out a lot. You find out a lot. You find out about a lot of this stuff after the fact. And one of those that I came across and other people are starting to come across is something called the Cloud Act. And it's the Clarifying Unlawful Overseas Uses of Data Act. It's a mouthful, but. When you cut down to the core of it, it has to do with privacy and how that's really changing. And this comes from the actual document, quote unquote, the Cloud Act is a far reaching privacy upending piece of legislation. So in that sense, you automatically have your people on one side who are huge privacy uh, proponents. They really want to make sure that everybody's information is really just trusted to them. They don't want anybody else or big brother kind of knowing where you are at all the time. And then of course there's the other end of the spectrum or the argument where people are privacy isn't really as big as a concern as is national security and making sure that everybody's safe and kind of the government and law enforcement is able to track down anybody that might be acting nefariously or infringing upon the safety of others so that's basically the two sides of the argument here and then the cloud act itself was proposed by Orrin Hatch a Republican within uh, the government and Oren says, quote unquote, the Cloud Act bridges the divide that sometimes exists between law enforcement and the tech sector by giving law enforcement the tools it needs to access data throughout the world, while at the same time creating a common sense framework to encourage international cooperation to resolve conflicts of law. So again, we saw this with Facebook a while back where I believe a Facebook account needed, oh no, it was Apple. Apple needed to, oh no, it was with that. Uh, right, so it was with Apple iPhones. And I believe it was somebody who had shot up a building. And basically, law enforcement wanted to break into their iPhone. But because they had a passcode on it, they weren't able to do so. And Apple basically said that they weren't willing to go in and break into the phone. I believe there, there could be other details in there, but basically that's the gist of it. And um, there's this divide between tech companies and the government at times where they really need to get information from people but these privacy clauses and the way that these big companies operate really there's a, there's a conflict of interest when you come down to it so the cloud act basically sets a precedent and a standard for how government should operate how 
basically what to do for all of these organizations when there is this conflict of interest because right now it eliminates the gray area that there currently is and again it's a decision that Oren thought was useful and apparently so did the Senate if you look at the way it was voted through there was a 65-32 voting in favor of the bill and alongside of that the other backers were big corporations that you see today that also have a huge control over some of these uh, over some of our user data so Apple, Facebook, Google, Microsoft and Yahoo all companies that have huge caches of knowledge about just everything that we do because when you look at it all these centralized parties have huge access to everything and again um, these companies wrote a joint letter about the about the Cloud Act and again within the letter they said quote unquote introduction to this bipartisan legislation is an important step towards enhancing and protecting individual privacy rights reducing international conflicts of law and keeping us all safer so again these companies are looking at it from the protection side of the argument saying look even though that it gives more power to these companies and these gov to these governments we need to do this to make sure that everybody's safe it sets a, it sets a precedent for the future so these companies and these organizations know that this should be followed by governments and we don't have to kind of sit around scratching our heads wondering what are we supposed to do now and there's again like an outline to follow moving forward However, on the other side, there's attackers, specifically the American Civil Liberties Union, ACLU. And again, this is all about privacy, protecting people's freedom, of uh, basically making sure that they're able to keep their information to themselves at all times. And the ACLU, they're looking at it, basically thinking, look, this is threatening our human rights. They think it jeopardizes the Fourth Amendment. And again, foreign bodies outside of the United States, foreign police, U.S. police, they're able to basically grab any information they want. You don't have to know about it. The companies that are potentially getting wiretapped don't necessarily have to know about it. So again, it's really just a question of why are these policies required? Is this overstepping bounds? And again, the ACLU doesn't appreciate it. Neither does the Electronic Frontier Foundation. That should read EFF. My apologies about that. But again, it really, you're going to have two sides of the argument every time. And one person in particular, when you're looking at it from a crypto perspective, who is really against it is Andreas Antonopoulos. He's a huge Bitcoin advocate. He's a huge influencer in the community. And he sees this, again, as a huge infringement upon our privacy. He's calling for people to encrypt and crypt go dark. And specifically here, this is where cryptocurrencies could be super useful. Specifically, I look at this and I think that Monero, Dash, and other privacy coins that have these really unique features where... You're not able to identify who, how much funds you have, how, like the total balance of your funds with these cryptocurrencies, and the government really can't do anything about that in identifying how much of your wealth you have stored up in these privacy coins. So I think for from a crypto perspective, any cryptocurrency that really doesn't have those cryptographic features that make it kind of uh, basically obscures any traceability to you, I think that... The Cloud Act in general is going to make that a lot clearer as to who owns what and gives foreign bodies much more power in order to, much more capability, I guess you could say, to go in and take that information from people and understand and uh, kind of get a better idea of how, who owns what, where everything is. Because again, if you look at this last quote here, it says that the Cloud Act allows U.S. police to grab any data regardless if it's a U.S. person's or not, no matter where it's stored. So from that, from a crypto sense, I'm thinking that that means the United States can take any information on the blockchain and demand that they are able to trace that. So again, that's just my thoughts about where this could go with crypto. But again, if you want to protect your information, people have, subject, people have suggested online how you can do that. And basically, you just want to get away from these centralized hubs like Dropbox, Gmail, that store your information that are owned by the Facebooks, the Googles, the Yahoos. So again, you're going to want to go to sources that are decentralized or encrypted. So SpiderUp, GrotonMail, CounterMail. Use two-factor authentication on your devices. So there is that additional layer of security. But again, this is something that slipped through the cracks. It, well, people just weren't aware of. And again... Um, We'll see how that plays out, but again, just thinking of how it may impact crypto, I think that this is really what we might see happen, and this could be used against people that might have resorted or gone to cryptocurrency to retain some of their privacy rights that they would not traditionally get. 
using a different currency or a traditional fiat currency. Moving on, going into Verge and their partnership. So I, I titled this The Hype is Sometimes Real because there's a lot of occasions in crypto where partnerships will be announced by these companies and a lot of the times you don't necessarily know if they're real until they're actually announced after the fact. And with a lot of ICOs coming out, giving these lofty promises, a lot of it is overinflated, a lot of it is not necessarily legitimate. And especially so towards the latter end of seven of twenty seventeen, where you really didn't have to know anything about the market in order to make in order to make money. Anybody who thinks that Anybody who was making money and really came into crypto not knowing much, you could attribute a lot of that appreciation to basically anything. Projects didn't have to be that great to make money. Everybody was, every single project was appreciating in value. So um, when you look at the communities of some of these coins, there's a lot of people that kind of buy into it and don't do as much research as you may, as you typically should which is obviously a huge complaint and a criticism of the cryptocurrency space. And I basically boiled that down to when, when you're looking at scams and why people fall for scams and why the floor falls out from people when these scams are kind of exposed, I think it comes down to two things. Number one, these people have an unwavering conviction in the project. They might have done their research. They might have looked at something that just convinces them, all right, this thing's going to the moon. I don't have to do... I. I can park my money here, come back in five years, and I'm going to be on a yacht in five years, in another ten years in the Caribbean. I don't know. But basically, they're just convinced. Nobody can tell them otherwise. And that kind of rolls into the other opinion that I have about this, is that some of these communities have echo chambers. If you look at the sub, and we'll get to this with Verge specifically, but if you go to some of these subreddits for any of these coins, it, it could really be anything. Some of the subreddits are worse than others, but... There are people in these communities and conversations going on in these communities that basically pitch one agenda, and that agenda is only conversation that backs the coins. So if there's any kind of negativity or FUD, fear, uncertainty, doubt that gets pitched in these subreddits, it'll get downvoted into the earth, and it's really just one voice that's being pitched. So again, I, I think it's an echo chamber within some of these subreddits, and it certainly is, as we'll see. And that can also help people lose sight. So if you really don't look for opinions that challenge your own and challenge your own belief, it's going to be difficult to really get both sides of the story. And with this Verge partnership, I think it's a huge issue. They just proposed something, um, or at least they just alerted their community about an opportunity to have the largest partnership in crypto to date, which, I mean, that I, I personally think that's a red flag alone because you look at these projects like Stellar, that and Omni Say Omni Say Go that have huge huge deals going on with these with these countries companies IBM is partnered with Stellar Microsoft is involved with a couple other cryptocurrency projects but again for Verge to come out and say that they have an important update with with a huge with a huge company that they're not going to disclose until they're able to obtain three million dollars in a crowdfunding effort which is what they did ask of their community. It seems very obscure. It seems outrageous, and and there's no value coming from it otherwise, other than them announcing the partnership. And as we'll go into this, Verge has a history of announcing announcements. And Justin Sun, the founder and CEO of Verge, I mean, people have kind of made him into a meme, or at least his his uh, kind of tendency to say that he has an announcement about announcements and again like it's it's all about added value like where is the value coming from with this marketing campaign it seems like Tron for the most part was really pumping up a lot of their marketing to have people buy in who really aren't looking to do much research but really just see these announcements coming from the company that look really promising so they think or right, look like there's a lot of traction coming from other people in the community. I mean, you look at, I mean, I guess that's a decent amount of retweets and likes. Who knows? You have to look at that relative to the rest of the space, too. But, I mean, this really doesn't, this is no, there's no substance here. So, again, um, it, it's a matter of added value and where it's coming from. And, again, if you look at, this is a picture of the subreddit of the Verge. And, basically, it's these are the top posts in the last 24 hours. Everybody is just so hyped up on these donations coming in. But, again, if you look at the other side of the spectrum for people that are outside of the community, 
Well, Panda puts it really well. I mean, it's it's even more scammy than an ICO since you don't even get fun, as in like you get to enjoy it, and useless tokens for <laughs> useless tokens for it. And again, he makes a good analogy. He could get donations to secure a partnership with his Lambo dealer. There, there's nothing coming from this other than them saying that we're going to announce something. So again, this this really puts a damper on the spaces on the space in general. You really want something more coming out of that if you're going to ask their ask your community to donate three million dollars. It just seems outrageous. And this is coming from one of the top comments or the top posts in Verge's subreddit. Somebody know your coin actually kind of is like, wait, like what what's going on here? I mean I'm invested at the same time. I'm personally not invested in Verge, but know your coin is. He's just saying, look, I don't like why do we have to raise funds just to announce a partnership and developments? Like why can't they just be a little more open about this and the the top voted response I'm in I mean again this is super biased this is super biased I think this guy has the hashtag Verge Army he starts out saying it's honestly not that difficult to figure out but again if you start a sentence like that or start a statement like that I'm beginning to think that it's probably hard to figure out if you think that it's blatantly obvious that everybody should just know like they have to ask for money like pay a fee give me three million dollars to announce something I mean I again I just think this is weird um, if you're going to get involved in Verge, or if, you're, or if you're involved in Verge already, maybe take a step back if you haven't done all of your research and think think to yourself, look, like, is this something that I really think is going to be useful long term? And then look at all their announcements and look at the work in product. If there's a work in product, again, I really don't know much about Verge. I haven't really subscribed to or, or committed to do much research on it just because I think it's kind of fraudy. But again, that's just my opinion. It's not intended to be investment advice by any means, but if you want to look into it on your own or are involved, just, just take a look back and kind of think to yourself, is there a bit of an echo chamber going on? And if there isn't really much of an announcement, it should be coming out today uh, so we can find out more about it. But they also did mention that unless there's not, if they don't raise $3 million, they're not announcing anything. And it didn't look like they're going to at this point. So... I mean, again, just a bunch of hype without really any value behind it. So, yeah, if, if I were in Verge and I saw this, I'd be a little concerned and just maybe want to take a look at it again. Going on to where's blockchain. So, AgroCoin is a cryptocurrency that is backed by the habanero pepper. And I looked at this not really as uh, much of an investment opportunity, but really just an interesting circumstance where blockchain is being used to it's it's trying to be pegged to hard assets and I think I really don't know how how this could really work but again AgriCoin it has blockchain it has spicy food and it has a risky investment so it's a trifecta it hits all the slots for anybody that's really looking to look into something that's kind of out there in, in terms of the investment opportunity but again this is more of uh, I, I saw this as more as entertaining to just see how far blockchain can go in the space. Again, who knows? It could actually work, but within just just looking at the overview of the token, this really the biggest red flag I see here is that they promised or or the founders or creators of the coin said that they expect yields of thirty percent a year, and they're basing that off of the profits. I'd assume that come from or I expect come from the actual peppers that are being produced by this company. So again. They have their proposal is they want to rate they want to I guess administer a total of one million agro coins, which would be backed by 100 hectares of habanero peppers. And right now they've only sold 5,000 tokens and they have five hectares under their possession. Apparently they can scale and acquire more hectares, but right now there's only five, so we're 95 short from there. And there might actually be 50,000 tokens sold. So again. Um, we're 95 hectares short, and we're 950,000 tokens short of the target. So they've done some fundraising, but again, uh, short of the target. So maybe investors are still filtering in. Maybe people are just trying to stay away from this project. I personally think the latter, because again, it's it seems like a stretch of an investment. And again, one agricoin is 500 pesos. The articles I looked at said that was around like 27 US dollars. But again, another promise that was listed was that the agri-coin would adhere to fintech laws. So that, again, comes circles back to whether or not it's properly listed as perhaps security. But 
again, like it has to be in compliance with securities and regulations, or else, again, there's going to be more hurdles down the road. I personally think, again, if you're a big pepper guy, if you're a big spice guy, don't mix business with pleasure, particularly something that doesn't necessarily have to go on the blockchain. I mean, if this company is already making money off of the off of the habanero pepper, why would you put it onto the blockchain if you're if you're not controlling the total supply of the chili to begin with? The the founders cited that Again, they think that because there's a stable supply of the pepper or a stable demand of the pepper in the United States and there's a steady production, that they think there's going to be more inherent stability in the coin compared to other cryptocurrencies. I don't see how you can make such a statement like that unless it's already in the market. It's not like you can start producing a crop and assume that it's going to replicate the same characteristics of a stable coin that, as we'll see later on in the presentation, requires a lot of research and a lot of kind of testing by more sophisticated technologies than just going into a field and producing peppers. So again, I really don't see the credibility behind this project. And Pablo Arteaga Vega, he's the CEO, he said, quote unquote, we saw the opportunity of using the cryptocurrency backing technology blockchain to share the profits of their production. But again, you see the opportunity to do it, but that doesn't mean that you that doesn't mean that you should do it. Um, they were targeting folks that don't have as much money, that were really looking to invest in something, but had limited capital. So again, just because you're, just because you have something to do, doesn't mean that you have to throw peppers on the blockchain. And again, I think this is going to be more of a shitcoin, as the as the community likes to call it. Just not really much credibility behind it. So again, that's just my opinion. Take or leave it. But I, I think that's pretty much a general consensus going on here. For what else you should read today, Santander is involved with Ripple, and Ripple has had, I, I personally, again, am not too convinced about Ripple in terms of an investment for long terms, in terms of appreciation, but Santander is going to roll out the first cross-border payment app with Ripple, and it's going to be international, it's going to be, inter it's going to be released in, I believe, the UK and three or four other countries to start. But essentially, this is going to allow Santander customers to facilitate transactions from their accounts through, or I guess um, from bank to bank using Ripple. So again, this is going to be a huge launch. Whether or not it's going to get rolled out after that, we'll have to wait and see uh, how the application goes in these countries. But again, this should be a pretty big move for Ripple and also banks and hopefully investors are going to be going to like the rollout too. For Yahoo Japan, they want to launch a cryptocurrency exchange and that's supposed to roll out in April 2019. I believe they have investments in other companies alongside it, but again, it shows that some of these bigger companies are starting to get involved in crypto and they kind of want to get their toes wet, wet their beak a little bit in the space and an easy way to do that, or maybe not an easy way, but a profitable way to do that if it's done properly is to launch a cryptocurrency exchange. It gives people, well, companies that launch it are able to profit on the spreads and also um, just also listing tokens too. Binance, Bittrex, uh, any other exchanges that do list these tokens, apparently they're able to charge some pretty lofty fees to place the currencies on the actual exchanges. And again, it, it's just another way to get involved in the space. Great success for Telegram. They were able to raise $850 million in a first round of funding for their SEO. I believe they were able to do it from one institutional investor for pricing the gram, which is their cryptocurrency token, at about $0.37 cents a pop. I believe the next funding round, they're going to crank that up and try to reach their goal of, I believe it's $1.8 billion. Again, don't quote me on that, but it's... Um, or 1.7 billion. I think they're looking to raise another 850 mil, and the price for those, for the gram in that second funding round, should be around 1.3 dollars. So again, the premium is going up. So these people in the first round of investments are already going to make a huge return on that. But again, whether or not the Telegram ICO is going to be successful down the road, we don't know. But they're going at this rate. They're the largest ICO, or the largest funded ICO. I believe Filecoin was the largest one prior to that. But again, big things coming out of Telegram and their project. 
Next, the economist behind Black-Scholes, the option formula that determines how to value options. They, he's de he or she is developing a stablecoin with the Saga, the Saga Foundation. They're a Swiss-based company. And again, stablecoins are going to be very helpful in the space. A lot of central banks are pondering releasing a central bank digital currency on the blockchain. And as we can see, Jesse Lund, the VP of IBM, thinks that central banks are going to tokenize fiat currencies on Stellar's blockchain soon. I personally think that these currencies, whenever they are released, is going to be a stablecoin. So these economists are looking into how to execute a stablecoin, the code base for these stablecoins. And again, looking back at, circling back to AgroCoin, I think that if you're going to have some, stab some stability, some low volatility, stablecoins are going to be how you're going to do it, obviously. And there has to be more mathematics behind it. So again, that kind of is another shot at um, the AgroCoin. But again, it just shows that there's a lot of smart people getting involved in the space trying to find a solution because they really do think that fiat and wealth in general is going to be placed on the blockchain in the future in order and in order to do that to allow for transactions to take place you really need to dampen the volatility so stable coins are going to be the solution for that or at least they're believed to be again more fraud going on here with hackers and basically why there needs to be blockchain and why there needs to be blockchain to prevent cybersecurity issues computer systems in Atlanta so Atlanta Computer Systems, they were shut down by hackers and they demanded the $51,000 Bitcoin ransom. You can read more about that in the link. And American capitalist or venture capital investor Tim Draper, he got involved with VeChain recently. He announced that he had investment in there. This is great for the VeChain community. I'm not, again, super familiar with the project. I'm just really reporting on the news day today. I want to get more involved with it and understand what's going on deeper within the weeds. But this is huge news, Tim Draper is generally thought to be a smart guy in the space and the fact that he's bullish on VeChain shows that he's done his homework and he really thinks he thinks that there's good things coming so if you want to get a look into V if you want to take a look into VeChain and see if it may have some use cases down the road I believe there are use cases too right now but definitely take a look at that and see what could take shape there for bulls and bears we're looking at engine well at least for bulls we're looking at engine they're a smart contract cryptocurrency for gaming and they partnered with unity technologies and basically the mission statement here for engine coin is to bring fairness and purpose to gaming and they're trying to tokenize all virtual goods and place it on the blockchain so with that if you for instance in world of warcraft or any other game and you had some really fancy armor which is like it, there's only five in the game and you just happen to have some for your character or your character is level 80 and it's super high up, you put a lot of time into it, and you want to kind of assign value to that and say, look, like this is mine, I want to let everybody know that I own this coin, or I own this, I own this equipment, I own whatever it is. Engine is basically trying to make a system where owners can legitimize what they own in the game and just kind of enhance the experience overall for um, for these gamers. So again, the perks here, Unity developers, they have direct access to Engine's software development kit. So again, they're going to be able to better manage and create goods in these existing games and these upcoming games. And that's going to help them regulate these economies in these games and help improve transactions across these marketplaces. And by doing that, if you're able to create a system where you can basically, the way I look at it and the way I see this, you're able to liquidate any funds from one game and then basically by selling your items in one game for engine coin and then you can transfer that value over to another platform or another game and then using that engine coin purchase another purchase another good another product another product in these marketplaces on another coin so i think that this could really revolutionize virtual gaming as a whole i think it's super innovative and it seems like this is the direction that engine coin is going so all these developers that want to try to implement this for their games and assign value for gamers and allow them to have more fluidity with all these different platforms and these and these gaming interfaces, they're able to do that with Engine Coin with the blockchain. And again, um, another perk that's coming out with this partnership is that Engine and Unity is going—they're going to collaborate on projects, tutorials, 
and any ideas moving forward that they want to do in the space. And again, just looking at what Engine Coin has to offer, it's it's really a one-stop shop, or at least they're trying to do for websites. You have they've already have implement they already have an implementation with Minecraft where there's a beta plugin, and the full version of that is I believe going to be rolled out in early 2018. Right now, there's over five million downloads for the beta, but again, looking at Engine, they're a website builder. They have gamified forums. There's a mobile application coming out. They have 70 plus modules. It really is, Engine really is looking to be the innovator for virtual games, virtual gaming. And Unity, looking at their network, they have over 770 users. They have 5 million developers that have tried to, that have at least at one point used, used Unity technologies to kind of get involved. And again, they've touched 3 billion devices worldwide. There's a lot, there's a huge network with Unity. So the fact that Engine Coin is partnering up with me, that is, the fact that Engine Coin has partnered up with them means that there are so many more eyeballs on this project. So again, I just think that this is going to be huge down the road to just basically have more test runs and just more, I guess, steps in the batter's box or um, rounds in the batter's box to uh, test whether or not there is going to be something down the road and to see if this project has legs. So again, I think that it's going to be huge or it could be huge and is definitely worth taking a look at. For Bears, Reddit finally unsubscribed from Bitcoin payments. A moderator on the platform announced that they took away Bitcoin payments. One of the main reasons is that there were bugs with the Bitcoin payment options. Some people that were trying to use it for purchases were having issues. And then on top of that, Coinbase is changing one of their policies. They have something called Coinbase Merchant Tools right now that's in place. And the fact that that's being, I guess, uh, kicked to the curb for another feature called Coinbase Commerce on May 31st is making Reddit understand look like. I mean, we were using Coinbase Merchant Tools, so now that that's being bagged, we're going to bag Bitcoin payments. And they did say that they're going to take a look at it. And if there's a high demand for Coinbase Commerce, they may reconsider going back to it. But again, I feel like if there's still bugs kind of out there and giving people issues, then maybe they're going to sit on the sidelines a little longer until those are fixed. But again, on April 30th, you're not going to be able to generate new orders with the Coinbase Merchant Tool. And then on the 31st of May, uh, all those all these users are going to have to migrate over to Coinbase Commerce. And again, Coinbase Commerce, it's just been more successful. They've had more positive reports about that. And again, it's just integrating multiple cryptocurrencies if you're a merchant. So if you have a business or a company, a website that where you want to accept cryptocurrencies as payment, Coinbase Commerce basically offers one wallet where you're able to manage all of those funds and you can accept multiple cryptocurrencies as payment that are accepted by Coinbase. So here it's Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum, Bitcoin Cash. And again, it's an easy way, it's a safe way to allow your business to start accepting digital payments. And another thing that's being backed by Coinbase is their multi-sig vault. I see this as the fact that there, again, there was no attention really to this. It was expensive. It was for advanced users. So if Coinbase Commerce is being so successful and it and it has had so much so much success, I don't really see why they would have to waste their time on multi-sig vault. And of course, there are a lot of risks there. If you forget your password and lose your personal key, which I mean is tough to do, but if you're relatively unfamiliar, then you lose your funds forever. So there's more risk there. Coinbase is just going to focus on what works, the simplified things, keep it simple, stupid. And that's really Coinbase Commerce. So again, down the road, maybe they'll roll it out again. But basically, the multi-sig vault, just looking at it very quickly, multi-sig means that you need to have at least two people give their stamp of approval for a transaction to occur. So with Coinbase multi-sig, their feature basically said, look, like we have three keys. Coinbase keeps one of them. I believe there's, and then there's two other keys. One of them you keep for your own, and another is encrypted. I believe Coinbase retains a copy of that as well. But basically, there had to be at least two of those would have to be signed off on in order for a transaction to go through. So again, it's a little more complicated, not for the basic user. Coinbase Commerce is more catered towards the basic user, the way I look at it. All right, so wrapping up with divergence. So again, this is more for the people that subscribe to technical analysis. If you don't, that's totally fine. You can feel free to skip over this. But again, 
this is something that I definitely looked at when I'm trading. I still try to look at if I am trying to trade, but again, I haven't really done many trades recently just because I've been focusing on the paper. I've been, I've been focusing on doing more content on other platforms. But again, there's basically two types of divergence. There's regular divergence and there's hidden there's hidden divergence. And then there's two types of biases here. There's bullish, which basically means that the price is going to continue up. And there's bearish, and there's bearish, which again, that means the price is going to go down. And basically you're looking here at the slope of the price. So again, you're looking at the price chart to see what the slope is from one mac one, I guess like major high to another major high. And you're looking at the slopes of the of the indicators again, again, a major high to a major high. And they have to be within the same time period. You can't look at the slope here on the price to here and then look at the slope over here from an indicator to here on the indicator. Yeah, it everything has to be within one time frame. And again, it's the slope. If one of the slopes is positive and the other is negative, then there you have it. there's a divergence. And that would indicate that there may be potential in the future for there to be a change in the in the current direction of price. Again, you shouldn't use indicators such as divergence on your own. You want to always use those along with others to and, and basically all it does is give you more confluence to determine whether or not you want to place a bet on the price going up or you want to place a bet on the price going down. And again, TA at the end of the day depends it depends on how many people are going to I guess subscribe to it. If it, if it works and you find that it helps with your trading strategy, then divergence is helpful. I found it helpful. But again, uh, it's it's not for everybody. If you want to get more information, Baby Pips is a really helpful source. If you want to kind of get an idea about it, it, it the least divergence and TA in general, it helps you give it helps give you an edge in the market where other than that, like if you if you want to look at fundamentals fine. But I find TA to be helpful for at the very least figuring out entries and exits into the market. For long term fundamentals are always going to play out, but there is I think there is some credence to TA at the end of the day. Especially more so in crypto where everything is very speculative. So that's just my two cents. All right, so again, thanks for joining in. And if you do want to subscribe to our newsletter, again, check out our website, check out our social media, check out our Twitter. If you want to give us a follow there, check out our LinkedIn, give us a like there, Medium follow us here. We always ban out blog posts from myself, other people that want to begin writing for the Daily Bit. We want you to come to us and start to get more involved. So again, uh, thanks, subscribe. If you like this, share this with your friends. Give us a follow, whatever it is. But again, we're going to get back tomorrow with tomorrow's paper. But until then, thanks, and we'll see you then. All right, bye.